here we are again this morning, and uh, we're having a good time. I enjoyed the study that our friend gave to us in the 9.30 hour. Um, a wonderful message from God's Word, wasn't it? I, I wonder how many of you who uh, have uh, had a look around at the uh, other departments on the campground. Uh, there's one over there called Beginners. How many of you have been in the Beginners tent and had a look? Oh, only one or two of you. You know, I suppose the people over this side probably even don't know where it is. But it's over there. I came by the beginner's tent this morning, had a look in. You know, the outside of the, of the uh, beginner's tent looks like a parking lot. Uh, it's not a parking lot of cars, it's a parking lot of pushers and strollers. There must be 20 or 30 of them there, parked outside the tent. And I, I was fascinated by that, and that's what got me inside to see where, uh, you know, where all these little toddlers were and what was being done for them, and they're doing a wonderful work. It's good to see it, isn't it? All the, the uh, different divisions of the camp are operating well and, and uh, they're having a wonderful time out there. Now, the mountain people don't like visitors. Um, who do I mean by the mountain people? They live in, the gorgeous, in a gorgeous part of the United States known as the Appalachians. It's a chain of mountains that stretches all the way from the New England states up in the northeast all the way down to Tennessee in the south and uh, it uh, covers probably a couple of thousand miles. And I recall driving along winding mountain roads in the Appalachians in pursuit of my hobby, a hobby, nature photography, and observing the beauties of nature. And some of these winding roads lead to wonderful sights, beautiful things. And I recall driving along some of these winding mountain roads in the Appalachians only to be stopped by a gate right across the road with a sign, Visitors Not Welcome. Now you... You know, you stop there. These mountain people have a reputation in the United States for accosting visitors with long-barreled shotguns and nasty tempers. They don't like visitors. And so the wise thing, of course, is to back down and leave. While I was in Israel one time, I wanted to see the River Jordan and the site of Jesus' baptism. And uh, so I, uh, I set out in a car to, uh, to get as near to the river as I can, but as I could. But again, I was stopped by a sign that uh, read, No Access. You see, this had been a battle zone, and uh, I guess there were mines and unexploded mortar lying around on, on the desert there beside the river, and I was unable to get down to the River Jordan at that time. Sometimes you see a, a sign, No Entry Without a Permit, and other sites will have a sign up, restricted a access. And usually the reason for these signs is for our protection because it might be a bombing range or there's poison being sprayed there or there's an ammunition dump or something for our protection. Uh, sometimes it's for environmental reasons, the protection of flora and fauna. And they don't want people tramping all through there and, and frightening the, the rare birds or, or destroying the habitat of rare butterflies or, or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's to protect uh, assets. i never forget visiting in South Africa. You go up the, the west coast of South Africa and you come to places where you're not allowed on the beaches. And the reason why they have restricted access to the beaches is because the beach sand has diamonds in it. And the diamond mines have have taken up, uh, you know, options on all the beaches along there, and, and you're not allowed to go on the beaches because they're protecting their assets. But the effect is always the same. It stops you in your tracks, and there's no further progress, no access. I recall as a little boy in Hamilton, where I spent seven years in my school days, my parents, and I, re I recall sitting in that little church in Selkirk Street, and uh, my memory serves me that uh, there, as I sat, there was a text up front, right up there above the preacher on the wall behind him, that read this way, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And I used to shudder at the thought. <laughs> oh, yeah, keep silence before him. And I would look away from that text and sometimes my eye would catch the blue of, uh, blue of the sky outside the window and, and then another text would flash into my mind. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, 
the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? The more I thought about God, the more was I impressed with his majesty. You know, he became awesome in my mind, my thinking. The book of Job tells us in chapter 37, with God is terrible majesty. Touching the almighty, we cannot find him out. Listen, friends, how do we approach a God like that? All powerful and holy too. Terrible majesty. Yeah. Oh. So frightening sometimes, isn't it? Job tried to, to approach that kind of God when he said, where is God? You know, in a challenging tone, I guess he spoke these words. Where is God? And I will demand of him and he will answer me, Job said. Imagine a mere man challenging God in this way. And yet there may be times in your experience, in mine, when under pressure we feel like Job and we feel like shaking our fist at God and, or challenging God or we're charging into his presence and, and we don't get anywhere. No. The effect is the same. Stop. <laughs> you don't approach God like that. Then how do we get a hearing with God? Jesus gives us the answer in the book of John chapter 14 and verse 6. Wonderful text here. I want to read it to you. John chapter 14 and verse 6. It's very simple, just a few words. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but what? But by me. By me. So he's, what he's saying here in this text of Scripture is that um, whatever you want with the Father, you have to come through Jesus first. If you want access to the Father, see, if you want to talk to the Father, then you have to talk to Jesus first. If you want a relationship with the Father, you must have a relationship with Jesus first. That's what he's saying here, see. We're in this business together, Jesus says. I came, came down to earth as a man, and so I'm qualified to represent you before God. <clears throat> and I'm the only one who's qualified the only God-man, your perfect advocate. Now, there's another reason also why our access to the Father is through Jesus only, and I'd like to turn with you to Ephesians chapter 2 <coughs> and use this <coughs> also as, a, as a, uh, a foundational text for what we have to say today. It's in found, found in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 11 through to 13. <coughs> he says here, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision and so on, down to verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So he's saying there was a time, you see, at that time you were outside of the, the, of the family. You didn't have any part with Christ. But now, verse 13, Now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us. So here the text is, is very clear. He's saying there was a time when you were outside, you weren't even a member of the family, you were strangers and pilgrims. Now you're on the inside, one with Christ, made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice also verses 4 to 6 because, well, perhaps we should read first verse 18. Notice, for through him, through Jesus, we both have access by one spirit unto who? Under the Father. So the text makes it very clear that we have access to the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. Well, the word quickened here means made alive. We were dead in sins, but he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. 
and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Now I'd like this morning for a few, minute, few minutes to, with you to reflect on this access to the Father through Christ that uh, was illustrated or demonstrated uh, in Old Testament times in the sanctuary services. Now I don't know, it's possible that um, you've heard some of these things before, in fact I think most of you have, but you will remember that there was a courtyard in that ancient, uh, in the camp of Israel, there was a courtyard uh, set up in the, the midst of, of the camp, there were four sections to the camp of Israel, and Moses was instructed to build a sanctuary that God could dwell among them, and that sanctuary was enclosed within walls of white cloth. Inside the courtyard was an altar of sacrifice where the animal sacrifices were made and there was a laver with water in it where the priests would wash their hands and then there was the tabernacle itself, a tent-like building with two rooms known as the holy place and the most holy place. Inside the holy place was a seven-branched candlestick which represented the, uh, the Holy Spirit and the seven candlesticks, of course, in the, in the book of Revelation, used to represent the, the churches, God's churches. And here you have the, the seven-branched candlestick and the flame representing Jesus, the light of the world. And there was the table of showbread with 12 loaves of unleavened bread. And again, you have Jesus represented here by the unleavened bread because leaven is thought of as a, a symbol of sin. You know, it, it permeates the whole lump of dough just as sin will get and creep its way all through your life and destroy you. And so the bread that represents Christ, the bread of life, was unleavened bread. There were 12 loaves, one for each tribe. And there was an altar of incense there. And that's where the priest would come. And he would burn sweet-smelling incense, which the book of Revelation tells us is, is like the, uh, the, the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ that ascends with our prayers when we pray to God. He takes our prayers uh, by means of his Holy Spirit and uh, presents them in words that we are unable to utter, words that are acceptable to God. And that was the altar of incense. And then there was a veil, a curtain, that uh, separated the holy place from the most holy place. And in the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was a wooden box overlaid with gold, and the lid of that box was solid gold. It was called the mercy seat. And there were two cherubim, one each side, cherubim angel figures, with their wings meeting over the mercy seat. And uh, there from between those cherubim was, uh, was the Shekinah glory, and a demonstration of the presence of God that shone out from above the mercy seat and filled the most holy place. The presence of God, it was a symbol of God's throne, as you would well know. Now, when the sinner brought his live sacrifice to seek forgiveness, he would place his hands on the head of that uh, animal, usually a lamb. If he couldn't afford a lamb, he brought a turtle dove. And there were plenty of those in the desert. You could go out and catch them, you see, um, at night, perhaps more easily than by day. And so everybody had the opportunity to bring his sacrifice. Nobody was excluded through poverty. And the, the, the sinner or the head of the house <coughs> would place his hands upon that uh, sacrifice, that blood sacrifice, and confess his sins and the sins of his family, thereby transferring guilt to the lamb. And so now that the, the guilt had been transferred to the lamb, the lamb must die because the wages of sin is death. So the lamb must die. Now the, the man who brought the lamb was the one who killed it. You know that, don't you? The priest didn't kill this lamb. It was the, the man who brought the lamb and confessed the sins who took its life because it is our sins that take the life of the Lamb of God or took the life of the Lamb of God. And that had to be illustrated in the services that were conducted here at the sanctuary so long ago. And the priest then caught some of the blood in a bowl and sometimes he sprinkled blood on the horns of the altar outside and sometimes he took blood into the sanctuary. But when he went into the, the holy place, he would then come and stand in front of the altar of incense with the candlesticks on his left hand, the table of showbread on the right hand, and there the altar of incense with the curtain just beyond it. And beyond that again, the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory 
presence of God in the most holy place. And the priest would stand here beside or in front of the altar of incense and there he would mediate on behalf of the sinner who waited outside. Now I want to take up with you an imaginary conversation as to what, uh, what the presence of the priest there really meant. Um, I, I'm sure this, these words didn't take place, this conversation didn't take place, but it will illustrate what the type of that sanctuary and the priest ministration really meant. So here you have the priest standing now before the, the uh, altar of incense with the curtain and the Shekinah glory, God's presence. So the priest now addresses God. And he says, God, I'm here to seek forgiveness for the sinner who's waiting outside. And God says, well, sinner, did you say? Well, if he's a sinner, he must die. The wages of sin is death. And the priest says, yes, we know that. We know the wages of sin is death, but the death penalty has already been paid. And God says, been paid already? How do I know that? Well, the priest said, well, the blood. I mean, we have the blood from the, the sacrifice. The blood has been spilt. And God says, ah, well, if the blood has been spilt, then that's acceptable. You can go out now and assure the sinner out in the courtyard that his sin is forgiven. And so the priest says, thank you, and he turns around and he walks out of the holy place into the courtyard where the sinner is still waiting beside the altar of, of sacrifice. And the priest says to the sinner, your sin is forgiven. God has accepted your repentance. Your sin is forgiven. You can go back to your tent now, uh, encouraged and satisfied to know that the guilt is past. Now, that's what the priest's presence in the sanctuary meant. Though I'm sure that conversation didn't take place, but that's what it signified. And the sinner went away, of course, rejoicing because his sin was forgiven. Now, all this took place as the priest was standing there before the presence of God with only the veil separating between him and the presence of God. You're aware of that, aren't you? I mean, this is not something new to you. you. You knew that, that that's where the priest stood, in the presence of God with the veil between. And I want to suggest to you this morning that it's important for us to understand what was the purpose of the veil that was there. For years, I used to believe that it was there to separate the priest from the glory of God, <clears throat> to keep the priest separated from God's presence. But if that was the purpose of the veil, then it poses a problem, does it not? Because we know that the priest, in his advocacy role, represents Jesus, who is our advocate in the heavenly sanctuary. And if, if, the, the, if the veil was there to separate the priest from God's presence, then you have a problem because there was no need for Jesus to be separated from his Father's presence in the heavenly sanctuary. He didn't need a curtain to be between him and his Father in the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, you will not find anywhere in Scripture a reference to a curtain separating Christ from his Father in the heavenly sanctuary. The reason that there was a veil there in the earthly sanctuary was to make it possible for a sinner, the priest himself was a sinner, to make it possible for a sinner to approach into God's presence. Jesus, being not a sinner, does not need a veil to approach into his Father's presence. But the earthly priest did. And so the purpose of the veil in the sanctuary between the holy place and the most holy place was to make it possible for the priest to have access to the Father, to God. To make it possible for him to come into God's presence. It was the means of access into God's presence. Now, you know, the, the veil was not a means of separation, but a means of providing access. Now, it's, uh, there's no doubt that the purpose, purposes of the altar of incense, where the priest stood, and the Ark of the Covenant were intertwined. The function of those two pieces of furniture in the earthly sanctuary enriched each. The meaning of one was enriched by the meaning of the other. If we were to turn to Exodus chapter 40 and verse 5, 
We read there, or the text speaks of the altar of incense being set before or in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, while there was a curtain between, the text doesn't mention the curtain. It simply says the altar of incense was set before the Ark of the Covenant. In Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 6, it says that when the priests ministered at the altar, they did it before the Lord. So again, I'm illustrating for you and underlining the fact that the function of the altar of incense where the priests stood and the Ark of the Covenant were intertwined with each other. They were part of the one function where the priest now pled the cause of the sinner before the presence of the Lord. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 22, some of you have the NIV translation, don't you? 1 Kings chapter 6 and in verse 22... It reads this way, that the golden altar belongs. The golden altar was the altar of incense. And it says there in NIV that the golden altar belongs to the inner sanctuary. The inner sanctuary was the most holy place. See? And so here your Bible says that the, the altar of incense belongs to the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. Its function belonged there. The only reason the curtain was there was because the sinner could not approach into the visible presence of God without being struck dead. There was only one exception to that, when the high priest, after making a special atonement for his own sins on the Day of Atonement, went right in there. It was the only time. But uh, during the daily services, day after day, the priest was able to approach into God's presence because the curtain, the veil, made that approach possible. Now that's that's a significant, slightly different way, a different way of looking at the purpose of the veil, and I believe it's important that we see it that way. It was the veil that brought the two together. The one who was asking forgiveness on behalf of the sinner, and the God to whom he made his appeal. The veil brought the two together. No doubt this is why Paul in writing of Christ's ministration or mediation before the Father at the time of his ascension into heaven, and as recorded in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 19 and 20, he identifies Christ's flesh as the veil in the heavenly sanctuary. Have you ever wondered why it is that in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, the text reads this way. Let me share it with you. Hebrews 10 and verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay. So Paul tells us in the book of Hebrews, that the veil in the heavenly sanctuary that gives us access to the Father is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen it that way before? It's significant, isn't it? That we, the, that we understand that in every aspect of the earthly sanctuary there is a representation of Jesus Christ. He's not only the lamb, he's not only the lamps, he's not only the bread of life, He's not only the priest as he mediates, but he's also the veil, you see, that makes our approach into his Father's presence possible. That's the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus is central to all the details of the ancient sanctuary and what it means. You know, in, in other words, we find that Paul is trying to tell us here in Hebrews what I've been saying already in the beginning of this service, that just as it was the veil in the earthly sanctuary, so in the heavenly sanctuary it is Christ's broken body that makes his approach into his Father's presence on our behalf possible. If he had not died upon the cross of Calvary and had his flesh torn for the sins of the world, he could not approach into his Father's presence and seek forgiveness for you and me. It's only because his flesh was torn on Calvary 
that he has the right to do that and is able to approach his father as our mediator. Wonderful thought. As he stood there appealing forgiveness, as he stands there today, appealing forgiveness for repentant sinners, the throne of God the Father in the heavenly most holy place, for that's what the Ark of the Covenant represented, the throne of God, there, that's in front of him, and the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary behind him, and he's the veil. That, that to me, is, is a wonderful truth. Maybe this is why Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, this is why John, in writing the book of Revelation, speaks of Christ as standing before the altar of intercession in the heavenly sanctuary in the very presence of the Father, in the visible presence of the Father, because that's what it's like. Now I know there are some folk who feel that we've, we've got to have two separate rooms in the heavenly sanctuary with a big curtain hanging between because that's what was here on earth. I don't really, I'm going to tell you friends, frankly, I don't believe that that's important at all. I do not believe that it's important that we have two separate rooms with a curtain hanging between in heaven. Because you don't have in heaven an altar of, of a burnt sacrifice where God is burning the bodies of animals, do you? And yet there was one in the earthly sanctuary. We, we need to understand the purpose of the, the, the earthly sanctuary, what its function represents in the plan of salvation, and then apply that to heaven. And here we have it. It's clear. Jesus stands there with access to the Father because his body was torn on the cross of Calvary. And that gives you and me unlimited access to the Father through Jesus. That's, that's the glory. That's the wonderful truth of it. We're speaking of access here. There are those people who will tell you that because the Bible speaks of Jesus standing in the visible presence of his Father at the time of his ascension, that there's no 1844, there's no investigative judgment. Listen, friends, those people have their own agenda. Don't get caught up in that kind of stuff. They're, di they, they're diverting you from the, the truth. They have missed an understanding of the purpose of the veil in the first place. And when you understand what the purpose of the veil was, then you can understand why it is that Jesus stands in the visible presence of his Father in the heavenly sanctuary without a separate curtain hanging between. And that does not do away with 1844. It does not do away with the investigative judgment at all. They've missed the point completely. And you can have confidence in the truth that this church has been teaching down through the years when you understand clearly what the sanctuary meant and how it's applied in the heavenly sanctuary. Now let's notice in Hebrews 9 and verse 24, it says, For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You know, this is something wonderful. Let me just share with you something that thrills me through and through. At the very time when the accuser of the brethren, the devil, is cast down, and we talked about that in my first meeting here last Sunday. Was it Sunday morning? Yes. We talked about the fact that in, Re in, in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible tells us that the, the dragon went to make, uh, you know, attack the, the man-child that was born of the woman, and, uh, and, and he, uh, he failed to do that, of course. We know that uh, he tried to have him destroyed when he was born through Herod's uh, plans and preparations and failed. And then he whipped up, the devil whipped up the, the, the people to uh, have Jesus crucified on a cross. But by that very thing, he, he uh, sealed his own fate. <clears throat> and the text says, now is come salvation, the salvation of our God. Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell on the earth. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. That's when the devil was cast down, when Jesus died on the cross. And at the very time that the devil was denied any further access to heaven, who should go into heaven and open up access for you and me? But Jesus, see? Jesus himself, no more accusing devil. I think that, that uh, the idea 
this idea, well, I have the idea, should I put it that way, that God enjoyed the change. No more accusing devil, but instead just the prayers of contrition and praise from his family, from you and me, that ascended to him through Christ. Now maybe I should pull all of this uh, together because we're getting down toward the end of my presentation and we're going to finish a little earlier today to make up for yesterday. The Bible teaches that Christ, having purged our sins, went back to heaven as the ministering priest to apply the benefits of the atonement. That's point number one. He needed to come near to his Father in the heavenly sanctuary to intercede on our behalf. Point number two. He approached to his father, his approach to his father is made possible not by a curtain, but by his own flesh, given his sacrifice on Calvary. He continued to minister forgiveness until 1844, when, as Ellen White says, he opened the door or what? Or ministration. Don't get hung up on, on a door being opened and say it's got to be a physical door. Don't get hung up on a, a physical curtain needing to be pulled aside so that Christ can go into the judgment work. Ellen White says that in 1844 he opened the door, I'm quoting now, door or ministration of the second apartment. And then he continued to minister forgiveness as he commenced the judgment, which has continued to this day, the investigative judgment. He still provides access for us and pleads the cases of all those who belong to the family of heaven as we come to God through him. And let us watch what he does for us by means of this imaginary conversation that we had a little while ago. Now we're going to transfer that imaginary conversation into the heavenly courts. And so here Jesus now fronts up to his father in heaven. And he says, Father... I've come here to seek forgiveness for, uh, for the sinner down there, Athel Tolhurst and Bill Jones and, you know, whoever. And God says, did you say a sinner? Well, if he's a sinner, he must die because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus says, yes, we, we know that and we understand that, but the death penalty has been paid. And God says, did you say paid? I mean, how do I know that the death penalty has been paid? And Jesus says, well, here are the nail scars in my hands and the wound in my side. My own blood was spilt to pay the penalty for his sin. And the father says, oh, yes, of course. That's good enough for me. Then you may go and assure Athel Tolhurst and Bill Jones and all the others. You can assure them that their sins are forgiven. And Jesus says, I already have. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's already done. And so, you see, that's what Jesus' presence in the heavenly sanctuary really represents. I'm sure he doesn't talk like that. That conversation doesn't take place. God knows everything already. But that's what it means. What a wonderful saviour. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Who better to represent us to the Father? He who bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He understands because he is one of us, a brother in court. He knows our weaknesses because he endured the weakness of human flesh. He was hungry. He thirsted. He was often tired. You see, weary. Uh, I like uh, the text of Psalm 103. I, I suppose if anyone was to ask me, what is your favorite passage of Scripture in the Bible? Uh, it's hard to choose a favorite Scripture, isn't it? I mean, there's so many wonderful passages that have so much depth of meaning in them. But here in Psalm 103, this is my favorite chapter, I really think. And I want to read you just a few of the verses, starting in verse 8. Psalm 103 and verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. 
He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west. And that's infinite, isn't it? I mean, if you go eastward, when do you get to west? Do you ever, do you ever get to west? No. You can go round and round this earth eastward forever and you've never got to west. If I, if I choose, on the other hand, to go westward, when do I get to east? Never. Wherever I am, there's still more west ahead of me, so I keep going west. See, as far as the east is from the west, God hath separated us, removed us from our transgressions, like as a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. You see, he knows the temptations we suffer, endure, because he too was tempted. He hears our prayers, he hears our confessions, and our thanksgiving, and he presents it all before God. So there's one more text I want to read, and that's in Hebrews chapter 4. There's a wonderful passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Notice that word, underline boldly, see. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is perfect access to our Father God through Jesus Christ, wonderfully provided. And we may all come to him in confidence because of Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our loving Father, we, we are grateful for Jesus. We're so thankful that he was willing to be stretched on the cross with nails driven through his hands and his feet to allow his flesh to be torn so that in his body, in his flesh, he could become the veil in the heavenly sanctuary making access to the Father possible for every one of us. We rejoice in this. We, we exult in it. And we praise your name and ask us to, remember, to remain ever faithful to our wonderful Savior. We ask in his name. Amen.